April, how about if I start with some discussions or some announcements before we begin our discussion? Would that be okay? Great. Okay, good. So we'll go ahead and start with some announcements. Certainly want to, certainly want to welcome everybody to uh, week 19 of our uh, happy hour presentation. We will not be meeting next week, uh, the 7th, in observance of Labor Day. Uh, but I'm pleased to announce that the following week, on the 14th, our very own uh, Raj Yalamachili, whom those of you who attended our board review uh, will remember, excellent uh, speaker and presenter. He's going to be discussing life after residency. And it's a, it's a very, very good talk. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I know it's one that you won't want to miss. It's it'll timely and it'll give you uh, the opportunity to, to hear someone who's done a number of things talk about the options. Uh, Raj has taught, he's been uh, in the clinical practice of dermatology, owned his own practice and is now doing derm path. So he's, he's got a, a lot of good advice. Um, and then on October 3rd, we are going to be um, repeating our board review. Uh, for those of you who are preparing for the DermPath core exam in November, and certainly if anybody, I know that the certification exam has been, you know, was delayed, and if anybody wants to jump on and uh, just do a quick with your DermPath in preparation for that exam, we'd be happy to have you as well too. Uh, we have uh, kept a number of the same slides, changed out a few, changed out some of the questions, so it won't be entirely the same as what we did before. Uh, it's always good to repeat anyway. And uh, that slide deck will go out in mid-September, uh, mid to late September, in time for you to review it before our discussion on the, uh, on the third. Uh, and uh, as always, if you have any questions at all about today's sessions or anything else, feel free to shoot an email to, to uh, education at sagesdx.com or you can email me directly, tdavis at sagesdx.com. I think um, uh, April put that information in the chat. And uh, you can also call me on my cell, 210-416-4815 or text me. I'm happy to have anybody reach out to me. Uh, at any time. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, and um, today uh, we're going to primarily direct our focus to uh, uh, a few key anatomic areas, specifically uh, disorders occurring on the ear, uh, on the digits, and in the umbilicus. And we'll go ahead and take a couple of uh, forays uh, into different anatomic areas, looking at a couple of kind of fun polypoid lesions uh, along the way. So we're going to go ahead and begin with the ear. And we'll start with slide one. And uh, the specimen is a dome shaped papule, kind of a superficial shade biopsy. And uh, as we move into higher power, you can see that the uh, epidermis at the edges of the specimen is somewhat hyperplastic. The centrally located epidermis is thin with a little bit of effacement of the Ree ridge pattern. We're going to kind of focus on this bottom piece here. And if you look at the uh, bottom piece of the specimen, you can see a centrally located ulceration. And this ulceration is covered with scale crust. Uh, beneath the ulceration, there is subepidermal fibrin deposition, which is flanked on either side, get my pencil here, by these zones of granulation tissue uh, on each side of the fibrin. And then in the underlying dermis, there's a little bit of degenerated collagen here, uh, admixed with solar elastonic material. And this combination of features, as I'm sure most of you know, is uh, a diagnostic of chondrodermatitis nodularis helices, the top of the lesion. Uh, now, uh, if the biopsy is a little deeper of CNH, in, in cases of CNH, you may pick up a little bit of degenerated uh, cartilage at the base of the specimen. And the degenerated cartilage 
will have a pink color. You'll remember that most cartilage is blue. The chondrocytes are blue, but when it degenerates, it becomes pink. And sometimes you'll have a little fragment of pink necrotic collagen at the base of these biopsies as well. But I would say probably 50 to 60% of the time that we see biopsies of CNH, they're devoid of that cartilage at the bottom. And certainly on a board exam, they would be they would expect you to recognize this as a lesion of uh, CNH or consistent with a lesion of CNH, even in the absence of uh, cartilage. CNH, as you know, typically occurs as a um, solitary, usually solitary, occasionally multiple, painful papule uh, on the uh, helix, most common in men, anti-helix of women, uh, typically in, in uh, middle-aged or older adults. The lesions are painful. And CNH really belongs to the family of pressure keratosis. And the other entities in that, ent in that uh, group that can have a very similar histologic appearance include acanthoma fissuratum or the pressure papules that uh, develop uh, underneath a prosthesis uh, or between a prosthesis and the, the uh, overlying limb. And one can also see very similar changes in keratotic papules, which sometimes develop adjacent to decubitus ulcerations. And pathogenetically, what links all these conditions is that you get degeneration of uh, collagen uh, and uh, in cartilage because the, the uh, uh, structures are caught between two hard objects. In the case of CNH, it's the, the skull on the one hand and usually a pillow or a phone or something else that's, that's pressing uh, the ear against the skull. So the, the characteristic features, again, for CNH, and really any of these pressure keratoses are uh, a dome-shaped papule, usually hyperplastic epidermis at the edges, a centrally located ulceration or erosion, subepidermal fibrin deposition, blanked by granulation tissue, and degenerated uh, collagen, and at times cartilage at the base of the biopsy specimen, so CNH. Uh, the second biopsy was much larger. This was uh, a, a, a deep uh, scoop, or it might have even been a little incisional biopsy specimen. Uh, the, the stain's a little uh, pink or a little uh, faded, and I apologize for that, but it's a, a nice example of this condition. There is a big piece of centrally located uh, cartilage, auricular cartilage, and uh, what's striking is that you can see that the cartilage is partially degenerated. It's got a slightly basophilic hue centrally, but certainly out at the periphery, it's, it's pink and the nuclei are becoming somewhat pyknotic. Uh, note the, the uh, large number of vellus follicles and sebaceous glands that's characteristic of uh, the ear. There's some dilated vessels and solar elastosis. And as we start, Moving in uh, higher power and taking a look at the uh, cartilage, we see that there's fibrosis here of the perichondrial tissue with an increased number of fibroblasts. And in the region of the perichondrial tissue, uh, there's a pretty brisk inflammatory infiltrate. And if we look at the cells comprising the infiltrate, we begin to see scattered neutrophils especially adjacent to the cartilage. And then a few lymphocytes and histiocytes as we move out uh, a little bit more peripherally. And again, if we look at the marginal chondrocytes adjacent to the perichondrial tissue and compare these nuclei to the nuclei of the viable chondrocytes, you can see one, the degenerating or uh, uh, partial endocrotic keratinocytes or chondrocytes have more pyknotic nuclei and definitely uh, pink cytoplasm as opposed to blue cytoplasm. So what we have here is perichondrial thickening and fibrosis associated with a mixed inflammatory infiltrate with a lot of neutrophils located adjacent to the perichondrial tissue 
and degeneration of marginal chondrocytes. And this constellation of features is very characteristic of relapsing polychondritis. And as you remember, relapsing polychondritis is a uh, multi-system inflammatory disease. And in addition, in, in additional, addition to getting inflammation and degeneration of regular cartilage, uh, one can see uh, involvement of nasal cartilage and uh, tracheobronchial cartilage as well too. Um, these lesions, these patients usually come in complaining of erythema, swelling, and tenderness of uh, the ears can be either unilateral or a bilateral. A lot of times it'll look like um, cellulitis. Uh, but again, the, the key features here are uh, perichondrial thickening, uh, inflammation uh, of uh, the perichondrial tissues with uh, a lot of neutrophils early, later on more lymphocytes and histiocytes, and degeneration of the marginal chondrocytes, relapsing polychondritis. Our third slide, also from the ear, this is a much better stained section, uh, and this is an incisional biopsy. And if we look in the dermis, you know, we can again see a large number of vellus hair follicles and a few associated sebaceous glands. And um, within the underlying dermis, you can see in both pieces that we've got uh, some auricular cartilage here. But of note, there's this big cystic structure in the central portion of the cartilage. We've got an area of cystic degeneration, but this isn't a true cyst because there's no epithelial lining. And if we look in this cyst cavity, we can see a lot of extravasated erythrocytes here. They may have been the consequence of procedural hemorrhage. And there's kind of degenerated amorphous uh, basophilic debris, but really not much in the way of an inflammatory infiltrate. We've got the RBCs, but there are no lymphocytes, histiocytes, or neutrophils. Uh, and this change with a uh, large intracartilaginous uh, cavity with no lining and uh, no real inflammation is characteristic of a pseudocyst uh, of the oracle. Uh, and pseudocysts of the, the oracle are, are pretty uncommon. Uh, they're usually asymptomatic, non-inflammatory lesions. Uh, they can be unilateral, they can be bilateral. Interestingly enough, there's typically no uh, history of uh, antecedent trauma. And it's a condition that tends to involve uh, younger individuals, more common in men than women, and tends to involve the upper half or third of the year. Uh, and I remember right after I started uh, residency, uh, actually within a couple months of starting residency, um, one of my co-residents uh, was noted to have bilateral pseudocysts of the uh, oracle, which he had surgically treated. They were asymptomatic and not inflammatory. And of course, it's always a derm resident that develops something uncommon like that. So pseudocyst of the uh, oracle, again, remember, intracartilaginous uh, cystic cavity, no lining, possibly inflammatory. And uh, the last of our ear lesions that we'll con consider is this one. And I apologize for this. I, I realized once I sent the uh, slide out that uh, I'd sent out a, a, a photograph rather than a whole scan slide image. So you couldn't really zoom in or out uh, to any particular degree. But this is nonetheless a, a, a real nice example. Uh, what we have here is a dome-shaped papule. Uh, undoubtedly, this was clinically pedunculated. And we've got a uh, fibrovascular stroma. And embedded in that fibrovascular stroma are numerous vellus uh, hair follicles. Uh, centrally present within this uh, pedunculated lesion is a lot of mature fat, uh, as well as in the, the piece over on the right, uh, a big central cartilaginous core. This is a uh, mature cartilage. And the diagnosis in this case, of course, is a, a, uh, an accessory trait. Um, these lesions are frequently present at uh, birth. Uh, and they're most commonly located uh, in the preauricular region. 
They can be solitary or uh, multiple. Uh, and uh, if they're multiple, they can be linear. Occasionally, they're located on the neck as well, too. And uh, they're rarely associated with um, first branchial arch uh, syndrome, such as golden heart syndrome. Uh, but the features you want to look for, of course, are a pedunculated lesion with a uh, fibrovascular core containing bellus hair follicles, fat, and in most instances, uh, a, uh, a fragment or a piece of uh, cartilage. Now, certainly, uh, you can see uh, accessory tragi that don't have cartilage in them, uh, but the majority do. So, accessory tragus. And uh, we'll move on to our next slide, slide five. We'll take a, a little detour onto the trunk on our way down to the digits. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and flip the slide. And we have uh, an incisional biopsy here from the trunk. And uh, as we move to slightly higher power, let me straighten this out a little. Uh, we can see that we've got a centrally located dome-shaped pacule. Uh, the epidermis here is mildly acanthotic and gently papillated. There's an increased amount of melanin pigment you can see with the basilar keratinocytes. Uh, within the underlying dermis, there are large sebaceous lobules. And if we look in the papillary and upper reticular dermis, we can see a very large number of uh, erector pili muscles or smooth muscle bubbles. And again, remember smooth muscle tends to be arranged in fascicles and uh, some of the fascicles are cut in cross section, whereas others are cut longitudinally. And if we look at the nuclei in the sections that are cut longitudinally, remember the nuclei are, are larger than those of a nerve, and they tend to have uh, nuclei that are blunt ended. Uh, in cross section, you can sometimes see, uh, depending upon the plane, uh, little perinuclear vacuoles, and those can be clues to, to smooth muscle as well. So we have uh, a little bit of epidermal hyperplasia. We've got the large sebaceous glands, an increased number of smooth muscle bundles. And if you looked over at the right in this piece, you could see that actually in the dermis, we have a large number of apocrine glands. These have much bigger lumina than eccrine glands. And we see evidence of decapitation secretion here along the luminal aspect. And then the one last finding that really kind of uh, hammers home uh, the diagnosis here are the presence of these ductal or tubular structures in the dermis. And if we take a look at these, these are lined uh, by cuboidal and columnar epithelium, which is pseudostratified in areas. And there's evidence here of a decapitation secretion. And these structures are lactiferous ducts. And so what we've got here uh, is an accessory nipple or a uh, rudimentary supernumerary nipple or polythelia. And uh, this is uh, a fairly common condition. It actually affects up to 1% of the population. And it's actually more common in men uh, than in women. Uh, the lesions usually present as a hyperpigmented papule with a uh, centrally located papillomatous projection. Uh, and the lesions can occur anywhere from the uh, along the milk line, but they're commonly located on the chest or the abdomen, and uh, they, they may be multiple. And again, the histologic features that we like to see are uh, epidermal hyperplasia, papillomatosis, usually epidermal hyperpigmentation. Within the underlying dermis, you're going to see uh, follicular and sebaceous elements, as well as an increased number of smooth muscle bundles, and in most instances, uh, some lactiferous ducts or at least some apocrine glands. So this is uh, characteristic of an accessory nipple, frequently asked on board exams. Well, we're going to move on to the uh, digits here. And the first case we're going to look at, a lot of these digital biopsies were uh, kind of similar in, in silhouette. A lot of them are little dome-shaped papules. 
And as we move into higher power here, uh, we can easily see that we're um, near an anchoral location, a volar location in particular. There's compact orthokeratosis, and there's an absence of follicular units within the endoperimus. And uh, what we see here is an increased number of vesicles of cells within the dermis, many of them are vertically oriented. And the fascicles are composed of spindled cells. But these spindled cells, unlike the smooth muscle cells that we saw a, moment, a few moments ago, have much more delicate nuclei. And these spindle shaped cells, the nuclei are tapered on both ends and they're kind of S shaped or comma shaped or C-shaped, uh, and this morphology, of course, is very characteristic of nerve. And if we did an S100 stain on these uh, structures, these fascicles, they would light up, and these are little nerve fascicles. Interestingly, too, if we look at this particular biopsy and look up in the dermis, there are an increased number right below the DE juncture of Meissner corpuscle-like structures. And these are very characteristic of this condition as well. This, uh, of course, is a rudimentary supernumerary digit, uh, or polydactyly. And these lesions occur almost exclusively at the base of the fifth digit along the ulnar aspect. Uh, they're uh, much more common, of course, on the hand uh, than on the foot. Uh, and they tend to present uh, in the neonatal uh, period. They're usually uh, asymptomatic. And for the longest time, it was believed that these represented uh, amputation neuromas, that uh, there was actually auto-amputation uh, of a rudimentary uh, sixth digit in utero. And as a result, these, these structures resulted and they were neuromas. Uh, but that's been questioned uh, over the last several years. One, because architecturally, there's no fibrosis here. Two, most amputation neuromas or neuromas in general are deeper in the dermis. And one repeatedly in this condition and very regularly can see an increased number of these Meissner corpuscle-like structures within the papillary dermis. So the thinking now is that these probably represent neural malformations rather than amputation aromas occurring at the site of an accessory digit. But nonetheless, this is a uh, uh, rudimentary supernumerary, dig supernumerary digit or uh, polydactyly. And, and again, the characteristic features, dome-shaped papule, uh, the Meissner corpuscles and the papillary dermis, and an increased number of nerve fascicles uh, within the uh, underlying dermis. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide seven. Slide seven has a very similar appearance. Uh, you can see that we've got a, a dome-shaped papule. There's compact orthokeratosis uh, here. The epidermis is maybe a little thin centrally. And if we look in the dermis here, uh, we can see that uh, this looks a little different than the last case. And uh, what we have here is a central core of slightly thickened collagen bundles. Most of these are vertically oriented. Uh, and in the dermis, we've got kind of these plump stellate fibroblasts, as well as a prominent vascular component with small caliber vessels that are increased in number and uh, dilated. And uh, this, uh, is an acquired uh, digital fibrokeratoma or an acquired digital fibroma, also known as a digital fibrokeratoma, a lot of names that there. And these uh, are felt to represent angiofibromas. Uh, they uh, frequently are solitary, uh, dome-shaped, uh, tend to occur in an anchor location, either on the palm or on the side of the digit. Uh, generally about one to three millimeters in diameter and uh, can get pretty high. They can get up to 15 millimeters uh, in, in height. And uh, again, they're much more common on um, 
the fingers than on the uh, on the toes. Uh, and uh, the key differential here really is between an acquired digital uh, fibro keratoma or acral fibro keratoma on the one hand, and uh, a rudimentary uh, supernumerary digit on the other. Remember that the former has the nerve vascles. Uh, the latter is an angiofibroma, and as such, you're going to see uh, the thickened collagen bubbles, which are kind of vertically oriented, pump stellate fibroblast and dilated vessels. And indeed, the uh, angiofibromas, the uncle angiofibromas uh, that you get in the setting of tuberous sclerosis look very, very similar. They just tend to be uh, a, little, a little more flattened. Uh, and sessile rather than pump. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide eight. Slide eight is also a uh, biopsy from, from the digit from uh, an acral surface. We've got compact orthokeratosis here, and at the sides of the specimen, the epidermis is somewhat hyperplastic. Uh, centrally, the epidermis is thin. And there's a little bit of uh, parakeratosis here. See retained nuclei. And this is pretty striking. And within the underlying dermis embedded in kind of a mixed weight stroma and transected at the base is actually a, a large fragment here of uh, mature lamellar bone. And there's actually even a little marrow between the, the bone elements. And this fragment of lamellar bone is covered by this fibrocartilaginous cap. And in the uh, fibrocartilaginous areas, what we see is an increased number of plump stellate cells and multinucleated cells. And this combination of features with uh, mature lamellar bone and a fibrocartilaginous cap and an acral location. Uh, is diagnostic of a subungual exostosis. Uh, these lesions uh, tend to occur near the free edge of the nail plate, so they tend to occur in, in the nail bed. And the patients can present with either subungual hyperkeratosis or onycholysis or uh, a nail deformity. Uh, these sometimes are painful. Uh, and uh, the most common location for these is actually on the great toe. And uh, generally, there's no cortical or medullary connection to the, uh, to the underlying bone. So these have, these have a very distinctive appearance. And again, uh, the characteristic features uh, are a, a fragment of mature lamellar bone with a uh, fibrocartilaginous cap embedded in kind of this mixed weight stroma. And again, it's a, it, it tends to occur near the, the uh, nail unit. You know. And the last of our uh, digital biopsies, we'll move on to the umbilicus. It's a pretty common condition here. And we can see we've got a bisected dome-shaped papule. And there's kind of this big cystic cavity present beneath a thin epidermis. And we can see Kind of bluish material in the myxoid cavity. And in some areas, we see these very plump stellate fibroblast here. The quantified layers thickened by compact orthokeratosis. And again, the overlying epidermis is thinned. Similar findings in the bottom piece with these uh, kind of plump stellate fibroblasts and this kind of blue stringy material. And this, of course, is a uh, digital mucus cyst or digital myxoid cyst. It's really kind of a pseudo cyst because there's, there's no true uh, epithelial lining here. And these tumors also tend to occur uh, near the nail unit, frequently located uh, at the base of the nail near the proximal nail pole, can actually deform the nail and uh, generally are believed to result from an overproduction of ground substance by these fibroblasts. This uh, mucin, of course, will stain with colloidal iron or, or alcyon blue. And this tumor also involves the fingers much more commonly uh, than the toes. Um, the big histologic differential here is uh, between a digital myxoid cyst and focal cutaneous mucinosis. Uh, focal mucinosis typically presents as a solitary papule, rarely multiple. 
kind of dome-shaped, rather nondescript in appearance. But it shows a predilection for the uh, for the face, the trunk, and the uh, proximal upper extremities, whereas, of course, a digital mixoid uh, cyst will occur uh, near an acral surface, so a digital mixoid cyst. Well, let's go ahead and move on to the umbilicus. I can flip it. We have a uh, shave vibes here. We have this little dome-shaped papule, kind of interesting in appearance. As we move to, to higher power, we can see some parakeratosis within the stratum corneum. Uh, the epidermis overlying the central portion of the papule is somewhat bent. One can see glandular or, or tubular structures in the underlying dermis. And some of these are in continuity with the overlying epidermis. So we have this transition in areas. Let me get my pen out here from stratified squamous to uh, glandular epithelium right in these areas. And if we look at this glandular epithelium, we can see it's, it's kind of stratified. We've got a, a peripheral layer of cuboidal cells and then more columnar cells along the luminal aspect. And there are a lot of goblet cells here. And so this is a very characteristic of colonic epithelium, or intestinal epithelium, specifically colonic epithelium. And if we look at the surrounding dermis, you know, we've got some lipid vacuoles and, and probably some adipocytes, but there's not much in the way of an inflammatory infiltrate. And when we look at the epithelium lining the glandular structures, uh, we can see that these nuclei are very uniform. Uh, there's not much nuclear pleomorphism or hyperchromatism, and certainly no mitotic figures. And so taken together, these, these findings are very, very characteristic of an omphalomesenteric duct polyp. And uh, these lesions uh, are uh, commonly present at birth, and uh, the patients usually present with bright red fleshy nodules. They tend to vary in size from five millimeters up to two centimeters in size and the umbilicus is a real common area. From a histologic viewpoint, uh, one could consider the possibility of, let's say, a, a syringocyst adenoma papilliferum, because in that instance, we also have transitional, uh, transition from stratified squamous to glandular epithelium. But a uh, syringocyst adenoma papilliferum uh, has cells which show decapitation secretion along the luminal aspect. Uh, there are no goblet cells within a syringocyst adenoma papilliferum. And of course, the stroma is pretty inflammatory. Remember, in the stroma, you uh, tend to see plasma cells, uh, large numbers of plasma cells, and that can be a clue to the, to the diagnosis. One could also think about um, a colostomy site, maybe. Uh, but usually, colostomy sites are eroded, and there's intense inflammation. And then one could also consider the possibility of something like a Sister Mary Joseph nodule with uh, a metastasis of an adenocarcinoma from the colon to the umbilicus. But there's no cytologic atypia here. I mean, this is a benign gastrointestinal epithelium. So uh, one really could make the diagnosis of a carcinoma based upon these findings. And I will add that in addition to colonic epithelium, one can also see uh, glandular structures lined by intestinal. So a thalomesenteric duct polyp, typically posse inflammatory. You get these uh, glandular structures that are lined by either colonic or intestinal epithelium. Uh, no significant um, cytologic atypia and usually a minimal amount of inflammation. Okay. Slide 11 is another umbilical lesion. So it's actually quite a bit bigger. Uh, Let's get our, our bearings here. We can see we've got epidermis here. The surface of the specimen is very papillated, and the epidermis is hyperplastic. And uh, one can see horn cysts and uh, almost little open comedones here uh, within the epidermis, very papillated surface here. But the most striking changes are actually present down in the dermis. And as we move into higher power, uh, what we see here is that we've got um, uh, these dilated glandular structures and associated um, 
stroma, distinctive stroma, set within a fibrous stroma. And if we look at these, these ductal and glandular structures, we can see that they're, they're lined by epithelium. There's a lot of necrotic debris, and in some areas, hemorrhage in the central portion of these uh, ductal structures. Uh, they, the, the epithelial lining is, is pretty variable. In some areas, it's one to two cell layers thick, and in other areas, uh, there's more columnar or cuboidal or pseudostratified epithelium, almost even a hint of decapitation secretion here. Uh, the nuclei are fairly uniform. A few are hyperchromatic, but they're not really variable in size and shape, and there's really no mitotic figures here to speak of. And if we look at the stroma surrounding these glandular structures, we can see that these are embedded in a very uh, cellular kind of fibromucinous stroma here that's, that's uh, quite distinctive. It's, it's a little bit loose and it's kind of concentrically arranged around these glandular structures. And there are a lot of RBCs out here in the stroma. And this stroma, is very characteristic of, of uterus, of uterine stroma. And the diagnosis in this case is cutaneous endometriosis. And in cutaneous endometriosis, it's a very repeatable pattern. But one always sees uh, dilated glandular structures. They can vary somewhat in appearance. This very distinctive, loose, concentric fibromyxoid stroma, uh, all set in a background of fibrosis. Um, the uh, lining, again, uh, of the glandular structures can, can be quite variable uh, because the lining uh, tends to reflect the cyclical changes that one sees uh, in the endometrium with menses. And uh, these lesions typically present as uh, blue, back, blue to black nodules that frequently enlarge at the time of menses. Uh, they not infrequently occur in the umbilicus, uh, but they've also been reported, of course, in C-section scars. You can see them in the inguinal region, uh, on the thighs. They've even been reported uh, on the neck. So, you know, they, you, you can get them almost uh, any place. But if you look at locations of ectopic endometrial tissue in patients with endometriosis, less than 1%, of uh, ectopic endometrial tissue uh, deposits on the skin. So cutaneous endometriosis is, is um, uh, much less common than say endometriosis in other ectopic sites. So uh, endometriosis. And our last slide, uh, slide number 12. Let me go ahead and tilt the slide. Hopefully this wasn't too tough for anybody. But we have a nice dome-shaped papule. The epidermis is a little thin, but gently papillated. And of course, within the dermis, we have a large, large amount of uh, mature appearing adipose tissue. And uh, this is a nevus lipomatosis superficialis. Of course, anytime you see large amounts of adipose tissue within the dermis, it does call to mind a differential. And included in that differential, of course, is Gold's syndrome or focal dermal hypoplasia. Of course, it's clinically quite a bit different than nevus lipomatosis. And one clue to the presence of um, focal dermal hypoplasia or Goltz's syndrome is marked thinning or attenuation of dermal collagen fibers, which you know we're really not seeing here. These up in the papillary dermis are, are normal. But again, clinically, there, there's there's no confusing the two. Uh, the other thing that one might briefly consider would be a big fibro fatty tag. And some people uh, feel that the solitary variant of um, nevus lipomatosis may in actuality be a, uh, a skin tag. Uh, the other thing that one might consider, especially in a smaller lesion with a little bit less fat, is a senescent nevus. Sometimes in old intradermal nevi, you can get a little fatty metaplasia, but you're always in the setting of a senescent nevus with fatty metaplasia, going to be able to see some melanocytes in the dermis uh, nested, and we don't see any of those here. 
Uh, nevus lipomatosis, of course, is a, a type of connective tissue nevus, and it, it occurs in several clinical invariants. Uh, commonly, it presents as a plaque-like form, so you get coalescence of flesh-colored papules, especially on the uh, gluteal area. Um, again, you can see solitary lesions of nevus lipomatosis, which may represent, indeed, fibrofatties, fan tags. And then finally, of course, you can generalize nevus lipomatosis of the setting of Michelin man or uh, Michelin baby. So uh, again, lots of mature fat in the dermis. You need to think about nevus lipomatosis. And that's kind of uh, what all I have today, kind of a whirlwind tour. I appreciate uh, everybody's uh, uh, attention. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to call or email. Remember, we won't be meeting next week. I hope everybody will tune in for uh, Dr. Wise talk on uh, life after residency, and we look forward to having you all participate in recordings coming up. Thanks so much. Have a good evening.